I rewrote some of those bid contracts for certain personas into sales copy, which covered off on what I would need to hear and what it got me as the customer, plus the known objections from those personas. Then I took that sales copy and I made that into animations, like cartoons. Then I simply got my new business team to call them and say, George, we've discovered this. Would it be okay that we show you? Now, to my amazement, eight out of every 10 went to contract. So then I got in trouble for how on earth did you shorten a 16-month sales cycle to three weeks? But what I'm really doing here, that element of closed circuit selling is bridging the gap between what sales and marketing should be by creating the right demand coupled with what their known objections should be in one place. Welcome to the B2B Playbook. We built this channel for small B2B marketing teams who want to drive more revenue for their business. Every week, we're showing you how to create more demand for your brand step-by-step using our 5Bs framework. So if you're time poor, resource strapped, but you still want to make a big impact on your business, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button down below so you don't miss an episode. Welcome back to the B2B Playbook. Listeners, as you know, we rarely have guests on our show. Instead, we select a few true experts who align with our view that B2B marketing is more about people, not platforms. Today, our special guest is Adam Mandorovich. Adam is the founder of Disruptor.co and Closed Circuit Selling. He's a go-to-market specialist and he helps you win across the funnel end-to-end. He's also the host of the Better Business Building podcast. Now, Adam caught my eye with his closed circuit selling framework, which is really deeply aligned with commercial outcomes, which is something I think we can all do better as demand gen marketers. I also love his saying that you need to go backwards to go forwards. What that means and why it's important, we'll dive more into this episode. He's a lovely bloke. He's one of our very few Aussie guests. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. George, thank you so much for having me from uh, this sunny Bondo over there. <laughs> oh, just down the road, mate. We can't quite uh, live the Lux lifestyle in Bondo, but not too far away, a couple of beaches down. Look, Adam, with many of our guests, I again discovered you on LinkedIn and have been following you for some time. There's two things about you that really stood out to me. That The first is that you talk about the need for deep commercial acumen, and I think you have a really clear framework for achieving that. The second is you called me Lavendi. So clearly you understand your target market. (laughs) I just like to bring a bit of flavor and a bit of something different to everything that I do and say. So yeah, I thought it was like a nice gesture. And yeah, I don't know how many other people got it in the thread, but. (laughs) (laughs) No, it was very funny for those who don't know. Lavendi, I guess, is like a colloquial Greek term that they use to describe someone as what do they call like what is it like a cool guy or a cool guy yeah. or whatever it is yeah yeah you yeah. call someone a lavendi i thought that mm. was very very funny uh, adam before we get into closed circuit selling i'd love to hear more about commercial acumen and from your point of view what is the current state of commercial acumen that you're seeing out there and where are people going wrong this is going to be a big answer no so i guess We'll get into further of like why I created closed circuit selling because that stems from this. But what I see time and time again is perhaps since the split out of Aaron Ross and Colin Stewart of Predictable Revenue, the outcome of those split outs has actually caused a lot of disruption for the wrong reasons in business. So what I see and what I keep saying is that it doesn't really matter how good your go-to-market strategy is after they've decided to make the purchase or the buying decision, if everything falls off and they become like a churn mitigation and then they become a customer level complaint. So if we break that down, what I'm really saying is that at every single stop gate of the buyer journey, there's problems. So there's problems of how people go to market. If you look at traditionally through the predictable revenue model, sales led growth 1988, we look at how do we put more and more into the funnel so that we can get the right conversion rate of that more and more to get to where we want to go. But no one really addresses the fact that 97% of those people, you've actually robbed up the wrong way. So what I'm saying is with the 3% that are are in market to buy, let's also look at what is their experience after they've made the buying decision. And companies don't do it. So I've noticed that personally from the early 2000s before the split outs, we would look at the full buyer experience what I call commercial acumen, like what happens after they've made that decision? Who negotiates credit, legal? What To what level do they need to be credit approved? 
what pro forma do we use for the legal contract? What happens at customer success? Do we bed down the communication plans early or do we not? But none of these things happen anymore because the people doing these roles, which is why I say about commercial acumen, are entry-level SDRs that aren't equipped to have any of those conversations. So what happens is a repercussion. It doesn't happen anymore, George. And so there's a whole lot of SDRs <laughs> out there that don't have this commercial acumen. No yeah. one's really looking at it. I suppose a lot of marketers aren't looking at it either. Why is it so important for them to look at that and to understand that? I think it's a bigger problem, but first we should look at prior to this, why was the solution already staring us in the face? So when I came up to be head of sales roles, how did I first get there? We would start before the split outs, we would start in customer success. I had to on sell, upsell, opportunity spot and work those accounts for two years, George, before I had the chance to get promoted to being in a sales role. So then I already knew the commercial line of sight. I knew who would pass the credit, who would pass legal, what the communication handover would look like, how often I'd see those clients and why that would be the best fit for us before I was in a sales role. So that doesn't happen anymore because we start in the front load of the SDR. So it's not actually their fault. It's just not part of their scope. So we can't expect them to have this miracle vision for the, what the end-to-end -end service delivery should be if we're not giving them that experience. Right. So they don't have the experience. And then I suppose the people don't have the know-how because yeah. they don't have that experience. So I, I suppose maybe that's a good opportunity for you to introduce your framework that you have in closed circuit selling. How can people use that to drive better business outcomes? It might be useful if you walk us through what it is and how it works. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Good question. So through being in, at multiple places as head of sales, what I continue to see is the breakdown between sales and marketing, right? So as you would know, in most places, and I'm not throwing sticks or mud at anybody, but marketing are obligated to provide no intent lead gen so that they can pump the amount of contacts that need to be hit to hit the meeting target for the customers that are potentially going to get put on. But there's no measure for if they churn, right? Well, they do measure it eventually, but they don't actually care because they're managing upwards of what lead to meeting target is. So what I found was how could we do better to make more companies say yes that should be in market and what what does that look like? So what I saw is no one was actually providing educational content mixed with known objections as the creative to say why George should buy from us and what, what it gets George against what George's known objections should be. So how I figured that out is in a couple of heads of sales roles was I was in a really, really big business and I was looking at the bid contracts and I was like, why on earth are we not getting these deals? We're the best in market. We've got a global brand and we've got the best price and we still didn't get it. So I looked at them and I thought, okay, would I buy from this? Now, what I found was time and time again through those big contracts, as I'm sure you're aware in big gov or big business, it will say 27 pages about us and nothing about what it gets George. So I was like, this is, I don't know that I'd buy from this either. Although that we are taught that is how companies go to market and that's the professional way to do it, what I actually indirectly uncovered is through going to market that way, it's more likely that they're not going to buy unless it's already within their purview to buy from company X. So long story short, I rewrote some of those bid contracts for certain personas into sales copy, which covered off on what I would need to hear and what it got me as the customer plus the known objections from those personas, then I took that sales copy and I made that into animations, like cartoons. Then Not I simply bad. got my new business team to call them and say, George, we've discovered this. Would it be okay that we show you? Now, to my amazement, eight out of every 10 went to contract. So then I got in trouble for how on earth did you shorten a 16-month sales cycle to three weeks? But what I'm really doing here, that element of closed circuit selling is bridging the gap between what sales and marketing should be by creating the right demand coupled with what their known objections should be in one place. So if marketers were unhandcuffed from what they're allowed to do versus what they're being told, that's what they would be creating. They'd be leaning into this is the content mixed with the known objections that will get these people in market 
because of this. But as a big business, they're not allowed to do that because they're too busy making lead magnets for no intent lead gen. That's right. That's <laughs> right. And look, I, this is why I, I was excited to have you on because I know that you really align with us and that we feel that marketing, sales, it's all about the customer. It's not about the platforms. It's not about the, about the actual customer putting them at the heart of what it is that you're doing. And so I love that you've gone even further beyond the point where they become a meeting to look mm -hmm. at how does it get through legal and everything else. And you're pulling objections across the full funnel, it yep. sounds like, and then you're feeding them back into marketing. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I obviously initially started talking about a lot of this stuff on LinkedIn probably three years ago. And a pro maybe a lot of my following latched onto the fact that I was talking completely top of funnel. But what they're probably now seeing a lot more from me now is, but what's the commercial clarity of this action by getting this all right in a closed circuit? So by that, I mean also what that company needs to win from company X, but also what are the milestones within that process to make sure that actually takes place? So as you said, will they pass legal? Will they pass credit? What does the communication handover plan look like to make sure that they don't churn at customer success? So if we're not going to do all of that, there's no point. If they're not going to become build and bank revenue, I don't care how many meetings you take and you pay someone $500 for, it's pointless. Yeah, absolutely. So you're really trying to get that whole team aligned there. It's almost yep. beyond sales and marketing. You're getting other departments in there together as well. I suppose the question that a lot of our marketers who are listening will have is, Adam, how, how do we do this? How do they get everyone on board? Yeah, so I think that's a great question, George. I think the answer to that would be that... Companies need to accept that this type of layered targeting and this type of demand creation and demand capture should come from marketing. So I'm going to say this as an ex-head of sales, what, six, seven times? It needs to come from marketing to be a top-down plan. What does that give us, George? That brings, marketing says we should go for these accounts. Because we should go for these accounts, these are the personas. This is what's going to help them win. This is why they're in market. This is what you should say. This is what you should send. And this is what's going to get you there. That brings sales into the fold. They also say, hey, George, at customer success, they're going to expect a plan that looks like this. So let's bring that in nice and early. So then we know the whole business unit from marketing to new business to customer success is working in one line. Um, and that's how we would do it. But to answer your question, you're going to need a lot of accountability to get off the hamster wheel of some sales led growth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, that is, of course, a challenge for marketers. So many of them are still just fighting to get their seat at the table. We lost it at some point. I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but marketers really struggle to have a seat at the leadership table. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose thank you for doing your bit to try yep. and bring that back. And also as someone who has been on the other side, I won't say the dark side because sales and marketing should get along. Yep. But as someone who's been on the other side, seen it across the spectrum said you know what we actually need marketing to lead our go-to-market strategy it's bizarre that people acknowledge that marketing should build a go-to-market strategy and yet sometimes businesses are cagey about tying them to business results or giving them the information that they need to help put that together mm -hmm. yeah it's mind-blowing really because they're the ones that have the expertise in the tools they're the ones that can do the cross-reference points they're the one that can work out what the triggers should be. They're the ones that can craft content applicable to those personas and accounts. It should be as simple as if we follow this, we can win as a business. Would you like to do it? Okay, look, you mentioned targeting and personas and that kind of stuff there. I want to get into that uh, and I want to give you a scenario mm -hmm. around that. Maybe Ooh. I can give you a scenario and you can take us through uh -huh. your process. So... As I said, your approach to targeting, it's definitely one of the more, more robust methods I've seen out there. So let's say you've got another client that's come to you and they said, hey, Adam, here's our list from sales of 500 dream clients that we want to land. What do you do? Can you take okay. us through your, uh, yeah. your, your steps? Oh, okay. This is going to, you ready for controversial? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. So I think we first need to acknowledge that if they're going to try to start at their ending point, they need to abandon that mechanism. So if you want me to build you some of these processes around that, but you're giving me a list of 500 of where you want to get to, process is not going to work and this is not for you. So what we should do is build 
a targeted list based on likely assumptions at account level. So that could just be buyer intent stuff that everyone can do. That's on Sales Navigator or wherever you, wherever else you want to get that from, dropping pixels, etc. If they agree to proceed, then you'll be like, okay, so based on these companies, I would look at basic stuff that we used to do in the newspaper. George, who's hiring? What do the job adverts say? Is that person the persona within the company that's also new to the role? Or when do they start? So within the first 90 days, more likely that they're going to make a change. Is that company also hiring in sales, marketing, or customer success? What does that tell us? That tells us that they've got budget. Right? So it's as simple as that. So then you just yep. pull that information from something like a polo, or you can pivot table that in clay, um, and then you'll know... These are the, based on these criteria, from what you've told me, these are the accounts. We can then look alike some of those accounts, and that's what that looks like. From there, I would use something like humantic.ai, and I would actually personality profile those personas inside of those accounts to see how George likes to be corresponded with. Because we would know that if he, George was dominant personality or steady or conscientious, he likes to be approached in different ways. That then also tells us for the sales team, based on this list of these cross-reference points, these are the ones that should be in market. If you're, tell if you're selling technology, you probably also want to pull their tech stack so you can see how you can work in with that. Should be common sense. And then from there, you just look at, okay, based on this, we need to say this. Go back to marketing and say, okay, you've given us these types of directions. What content do you have to educate those personas? Given that we've probably done this before from our previous win-loss, do we have best, worst accounts that are like any of these accounts? Tell us what their known objections would be or have we lost any of these in the past and what were their objections of why they left us? That then becomes the content piece. So you've got your education plus your known objections. George builds us the content. And then I go to those top 500 people and go, here's your list. Buy these six cross-reference points that should get them in market. For these personality profiles, this is what you need to say. This is what you need to send. This is how you need to follow up. And this is if you use dot points, salutations, etc. Makes sense? Easy. So that's basically how, what I would offer in terms of your question about the 500. I know, that's fantastic. So it sounds like step one is actually pushing back a little bit on mm -hmm. the 500 and say, look, we're not here to service a dream list of 500 clients because we're probably not going to get very far yeah. if that's what we're doing. We've got to mix that with intent, with those that are somewhat aware of our brand, with those that fit our product or service best. And then, as you said, we've got to do what you used to do in the old school, but we've got new tools to do it and find out, just use your common sense and think about what other signals can we use to indicate someone might be more likely to be in market versus those that aren't so we can prioritize our resources when going to market. Because if we just spread them, across that 500 we're probably going to go shallow and really wide yep. but from what i'm hearing we want to go a bit narrower and deeper yeah so then to match with some of my process which is basically what i dubbed probably three years ago permission-based creative which is that recipe for the creative and then literally just working out which channel is going to you might even have a question about that but which channel is going to be applicable to how they'd like to be communicated with and where can i ask george permission would it be okay to view this because I've found this, George? So talk me through that. I uh, mentioned channel validation, which channels it's okay to talk to people mm -hmm. on. How do you work that out? What does that mean? How do you work it yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good questions. As we know, a lot of companies are either super advanced or they don't even know how to pull contact data, right? Yeah. Would agree? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. So within, let's play on the other side of the people that are advanced, they would be also looking at when we're doing those types of targeting and cross-reference and trigger points, what channels are going to be applicable to that persona to have the best conversation? Because after, after all, that's all we need to do, right? To have the right conversation, to have the delivery mechanism, to be able to give them the content that's going to help them and us win. All right, so what does that mean? Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. So it could mean George is super responsive on LinkedIn DMs. But George knows, we know George doesn't answer the phone. So how to, at a high level, how do we know that? So when we're building these lists, we'll also run that through a data cleanse. So that could be enriching the email addresses, working out when they last posted on LinkedIn. Are they active on Twitter? 
do they use Instagram to do business deals? If they also answer the phone through a data clean system that we use, we can segment that into the people that are more likely to answer the phone, which you can also cross-reference with personality profiling and humantic. But from that, you'll know relatively where those channels, where the best channel is to have the conversation, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So you will basically for each person in the buying committee within an account, yep. look at, is it best to contact them via email, phone, or via socials? And if socials, which one that is, yep. I can see how you could pull that pretty easily through socials. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, in terms of phone calling, so you're saying there's a service that you can use to, to yeah, work yeah. out yep. whether or not someone answers their phone a lot yep. or not? Yeah. So, yeah. So that obviously came probably three, four years ago. I know that for the people that I'm not throwing mud at anyone because if you need help, I can help you. But um, the companies that don't know how to pull contact data probably also don't know that you can validate the channels. They probably also yep. don't know that you can segment your list into phone picker uppers or people that answer the phone and people that don't. And you can also segment them into people that are, have a high presence on LinkedIn or Twitter. Or they're on, their, they're on their Slack channel, but that's the only place you can reach them. Yeah, that, that's, it's, uh, it's come a long way since the day where we were running with pens and paper and Excel with desk phones. Yeah, absolutely. And for those listening, if they do want to try and work out whether or not someone's going to pick up the phone, is there a particular service that you use? Do you have people that do this for you? Is there somewhere they can go to check that out? It really, yeah, so for primarily I would use Task Milliams, like a DTF Pr- Prakesh, or mm-hmm. Maz Gori at Cloud League. Um, but it really depends on the complexity of some of these trigger points. Um, you might need, mo- without making this town too complicated, you might need multiple providers for each of the triggers that I talk about. But at a base level in terms of contact data versus where they're going to have the best communication, um, those two companies can definitely help you out. Okay, awesome. So it sounds like it's, a little bit more effort at the front end, but how much does it save you at the back end in terms of communication and picking which channels to communicate on? Yeah, so for our Australian audience, you probably don't know that the contact rates in terms of dial to connect in other countries are extremely low. So think of it like this. If your business development manager is sitting on a dialer to call companies that are never going to answer the phone, how effective is their use of time? Versus doing call blocks where you know that they're going to pick up the phone and you can at least get to a live conversation. Now, there'll be other methodologies of perhaps not trying to hard sell people in the first pass um, that I live and die by, um, but even getting into the live conversation should be the right measure in terms of effectiveness of that business development person. Yeah, it's a much better use of resources. Yeah. Absolutely. It It makes so much sense to do that work up front it's probably a lot more encouraging too for the BDR if they're calling yep. and connecting yep. and, and getting better responses rather than the phone just ringing out 50 times in a row. You did mention that there were other sources of data yep. that you would look at to to give you some kind of information about that company before it is that you make contact with them. So market intel data. Do you have any examples for our listeners of this market intel that you can use to get an idea of maybe a company's objections before you even get them on the phone? Oh, okay. Good question. So you could use Winter, W-Y-N-T-E-R. However, before you go down that path, I honestly recommend you do two things. So your business development, your customer success, your chief marketing, whoever wants to do it, doesn't really matter as long as it happens from the company. You, they need to do two things. They need to call physically call all of your existing customers and ask, why did you originally buy from us? Why did you leave? Were there any other objections that you didn't actually tell us just so that we can be better for next time? As well as your previous close lost, the same thing. Why didn't you buy from us, George? What could we have done better? That information needs to be catalogued. And then that becomes your live objections applicable to your product against those personas Then you can match that to companies of the similar size, similar industry, depending on other variations, demographics, et cetera. But they won't do it. It makes a lot of sense. (laughs) No, I know. It makes a lot of sense. And it's amazing. I used to be a marketer that was very into the collecting the data set through them and pulling, like combing through quantitative data sets. 
And then I learned about customer interviews and I just went, yeah, crap, yep. this made my life so much easier. I cannot yeah, believe what they tell you if you just ask. And the ask. insights are always so much better mm-hmm. than pouring through the data and just make, you're effectively making up stories and guessing yep. and testing hypotheses. But rather than testing and spending the time and money testing, just ask your yeah, existing right. customers. And if yeah. they're of a similar segment, similar industry, similar problems, a pretty good chance that same company you're going after is going to have those same issues. Exactly right. And that probably brings us to the next point of my process would be, and people like this blows people's minds, but it will just hopefully make so much sense. So before all these split outs, what we would do is we would call the companies and catalog them. Hey, George, I know that you're probably with someone right now. Would it be okay if you just tell me what you really like about it? Okay, is there anything you don't like about it, George? Okay, so you guys would be in a fixed-term contract for that? If you were going to go to tender, George, what would that tender need to contain? Boom. George, would it be okay if I call you back in four weeks just to make sure that nothing has changed? Okay, so what's actually happened there, you've catalogued the market for your targets, you've acted as an account manager for an account you don't have yet, and you've got permission to go back to them while knowing what the winning tender will need to be within the time frame to deliver. So then you go back to chief marketing and you go, hey, I just spoke to 10 companies that are going to be in market halfway through next year. I reckon if we build a creative that solves that problem and their known objections, I can get my new business team to call them and deliver that. But we're so focused on sales-led growth volume games to push to the meeting that if you suggest that to companies that haven't realized or recognized or weren't a part of that prior to the split out, everyone just goes for the hard sell. George, take our meeting. Do I need to send you a $150 Amazon bill? What, what do I need to do to get you there? <laughs> but it's where I say go backwards to go forwards. All I'm really saying is, okay, let's go back to when we actually did market research. Let's catalog the market. Cool. Let's go back to like permission-based. George, would it be okay I'll show you this? George, would it be okay if I asked you these questions because you left us? Now, if we do that recipe for success, there's a high chance you're going to win. Now, during that process of cataloging the market, you'll also probably get to the point of, so if we were going to do business with us, George, would it be okay if we just run through some scenarios of what that might look like? So what have you done there? You've then lowered the bar to talk about the communication plan handover at customer success so you can exceed their expectation when you've got a chance to pitch for it. It's not rocket science, but apparently all (laughs) these things are like now, like I literally write backwards to go forwards because I'm just suggesting let's just do some of this good stuff that always works. It, it, it's fantastic. It's so good to to bring it back. And in this world where everyone is obsessed with platforms and data, mm-hmm. to just take it back to basics and the amount of information you're gathering from talking to people who are your current customers that have churned and now your prospective ones. I mean, you're applying the same principle and you're approaching it from a point of curiosity. The way that you've pitched it right there to me, it doesn't seem threatening at all. Yep. And if you were that person and your contract is coming up for renewal, then why wouldn't you be open to hearing from someone else? You know, mm-hmm. it's someone's role in there to make sure they're getting the best bang from their buck for whoever their service provider is for that thing. So why not yeah. give them a little bit of information and be open to that callback at that point in time? It makes so much sense to me. Yeah, yeah. So set yourself for success and do those actions and it will steer you in the right path. But that'll also give you permission to go back to that person and, okay, hey, George, would it be outrageous because of the conversations we've been having in the last six months, could I send you some pricing of what we could do just so you can see what it's like on our side of the fence? Love it. Absolutely Mm. love it. Look, obviously this is a little bit higher touch than probably a lot of marketers are used to. Mm. What price point does this particular methodology make sense in terms of how high does that average customer value have to, to be worth the effort? Okay, let's go around the other way. At what is the cost to your business of not doing it the right way? Potentially catastrophic, there right? You <laughs> so you have- I look at it like this, right? So to directly answer your question, what's the cost of your demand gen team? What's the cost of your new business team? What's your customer success team cost? If you're not going to, if you're just processing accounts for the 
heck of processing. You're pushing deals to credit. You're pushing de- deals to legal. You're pushing the deals to customer success that just churn and become customer level complaints. What have you really achieved? That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, we encourage marketers when they're trying to push internally a business case and shifting from lead generation Mm -hmm. to demand generation, which is more about quality than quantity. We say, don't just look at the cost of the leads, look at the cost to the sales team in processing those leads or to marketing ops and pulling it all together. But then just saying, almost take it even one step further and look at those that get past sales, but aren't going to make it past legal. Mm -hmm. Uh, because yeah. you're just not aligned enough. And th- th- I'm sure that cost and that return on investment gets even worse. Yeah, so I would say that most companies won't even look at it. They won't question it at all. And I'm like, what do you mean? So you're telling me that you're paying a legal department to look at this for, for looking at deals that are never going to go past your department. Like, why not just not do that? I know <laughs> that sounds crazy, but hey, would it also then make sense to not push deals to credit that we don't necessarily need a certain Vita or Verifax score. Like, why are we doing that? Let's break it all down. Let's make it a most friction-free as possible for the buyer experience. And when we play from there, they've got more reasons to say yes and recommend you to others than, than what they do if you're just pushing them through hoops that you don't need to go through. It's only costing you money you don't need to spend. Yeah, absolutely. And I love how we start the conversation talking about commercial acumen. Oh. Typically, when people think about commercial acumen, you I don't know, you think of the uh, the financial review, big words, and it feels complicated and overwhelming. But at its core, it's understanding yep. people, talking to them, understanding their motivations, what could go wrong, a fair bit of empathizing. And that seems to be what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Obviously, I couldn't agree more, which is why I keep saying the stuff that I say. So, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Go backwards to go forwards. That's awesome. Uh, look, I've seen you say that people should sell the contract first you might have covered that already yeah, yeah. is that kind of what you mean when you say sell the contract first yeah man oh yeah yeah so just to, to dive into that real quick that's what i mean by cataloging first so yeah. if you look at what we did before the split outs of aaron ross's great work with predictable revenue that's what we did george who are you with right now what do you like about it and on the off chance that they don't have a provider they might say something like adam we actually don't have someone for that would should we? So it's not complicated, but people won't lean in with that because one, they're still in sales-led growth where they're not allowed to. They have to push towards the meeting. So they're not going to let all of their business development team catalog the market, which will give them the answers that would give them the contracts. Yeah. So basically to answer your question directly, leading in with who are you possibly with right now? I know you're with someone, but is it okay if you tell me what you like? Is there anything, George, that you don't like about it? If you had the ability to change something with a magic wand, what would it be? George, so basically what you're telling me, are you in a locked-in contract right now? George, would it be okay if you were going to go to tender, would you be able to, what you've covered off on what you'd like to change, would that need to be in the winning bid? It's as simple as that. I mean, then you've got the winning formula to go back with permission, with the things that's going to hit their key drivers, and you can set your company for success. No, that, that's fantastic. And typically, I suppose it depends on the organization and the yeah. size. Whose role does it fall to, to catalogue the market? I, I, okay, good point. Oh, that's a, oh, okay. This is a good question. Who's oh, doing the dirty work, Adam? Oh, all right. <laughs> so if we look at this from a commercial perspective, who's going to be best equipped to hold that conversation? Depending on the ability of marketing when they're doing the targeting, maybe they should do it. But because marketing has stepped away from doing market research in terms of phone calls since the late 90s, it's probably not going to sit there anymore because the people doing that are really good at data and really good at creative and doing really good edits. I hope. I hope they're not just doing no intent lead back. <laughs> so it's probably the more seasoned people that came through the traditional path of getting promoted from customer success to business development that are probably 30 to 45 that can have that conversation. They should catalog the market and then give it out to the rest of the team, if that answers the question. Um, I don't think that... For a new business that should come from customer success, although I have seen some companies do that. I've even seen some companies delegate that to people that do RevOps tools. But I think to answer your question directly, it should sit with business development that are comfortable, that are seasoned veterans to have those conversations. That doesn't mean your entry-level SDR that you've just hired for 75K that's too scared to speak to people. That doesn't mean the people you're making and pushing to their 10,000-person sequencer 
That means the people that are already having these types of conversations at a high level of and high scoring rate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And it makes sense that you would put someone who's competent enough to talk to that potential customer to build that relationship too, because they could be the one who's calling back and checking mm -hmm. in four weeks time because they've already built that relationship with them. I think it's quite jarring when you have a conversation with one person and then someone else from the company calls you back in four weeks or so, and you don't have that rapport with them. Mm -hmm. You didn't have that first moment with them. And, but look, that's a tough task. I think for yeah. a lot of people to get their employees to do because it's just seen as a low value task for some reason when it shouldn't be, when it shouldn't be, yeah. they'll push it down to one of the underlings, yeah. but it's so incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. It needs to sit with someone that can hold that conversation. And that actually leads us into another topic. That's pretty hot. Why would you pass it off to the conveyor belt of your SDR AE CS chain when you should just be getting those people that have the skills to do full cycle and working in with marketing from the start? <laughs> All right. Tell us more about that, please. As you pointed out just there, people don't want to hear from three different people. People don't want to be pushed into meetings that they don't need to take. People want to know, I've seen this educational content that's also covered off from these known objections. I want to speak to the person that can guide me through that process through my bioassisted actions. And that doesn't happen in the split out model, does it? No, it doesn't. I know it doesn't. You've got to have a, a hybrid team. Mm -hmm. They've got to work together, right? Yeah. That everyone has to be across the same detail, mm -hmm. working together towards the same revenue targets. But that's that can be tricky. That mm -hmm. can be tricky to do. Look, you've been on both sides of the fence. You've been on the sales side. You've been on the marketing side. Why do you think it's gone all so wrong in terms of the division between the two teams? I think so. Okay, that's a really, that, that's a good question. Okay, here we go. I'll answer that question with another question, just so you can see where I'm positioning this from. If you asked, let's do a swatch test of asking the market, what do you believe marketing's core task is? What do you think the answer would be, George? Uh, most people are going to say to drive leads yep. for sales. Just get us leads, <laughs> man, just get us leads. That's what they're going to say. Wrong. They're here to create and capture demand so that the sales team can do buyer assisted actions. Right. So yep. if that is the flavor from market of their intrinsic understanding being incorrect, that's where it's gone so wrong because maybe they've never seen a demand gen engine actually work properly with a business development person that just can literally just cut the market in a quarter of the cost time worry. Yeah, definitely. I wonder if it's, if it comes about from the panic that settles in when an organization starts to grow mm. they hire their first salesperson maybe their second one and then their marketer and that salesperson just has time mm -hmm. on their calendar and so then immediately the marketer's job is to try and fill that what? and the what? way that they try and do that is to try and get as many leads mm -hmm. and then to nurture as possible and look, I understand in those early stages, you got to do what you got to do to try and scrape through, but that does not scale at all. From your experience giving, exp well, expertise to multiple companies with on the marketing side, like right now, do you not think that it's possibly what they're tasked and how they're measured? Absolutely. Yeah. That becomes an official method of measurement for yeah, them. Yeah. And then you have systems like HubSpot, which have trained a whole generation of marketers to believe that their targets are MQLs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the tools have yeah. now created the behavior that's caused the issue that's called the misalignment. That's right. And look at every platform that we use to advertise mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, Meta, they all have lead gen forms and promote yeah, yeah. their newest yep. developments in lead gen forms. And promote how easy it is to integrate into, this, into your CRM. So like we just have these tech behemoths who have taken it upon themselves to educate the mm -hmm. market because that's their own go-to-market strategy. Mm -hmm. And they have proposed a narrative that suits themselves, that it's all about leads and driving MQLs. That's your job. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. If you want to look at maybe another person that's talking a lot about this who's anti-tech stack now, look at Sean Cease, the sales professor. Yeah, I... We again backwards to go forwards. Yeah, I know. I love it. I love this mentality that is finally coming back around. Mm. I haven't seen a whole lot of people who are talking about it, to yeah, be honest, yeah. Adam. I love you've got to go backwards to go forwards. 
and that's why I'm so excited to have you on today. Is there anything you'd like to add to the conversation before we wrap this up, Adam? Anything that comes to mind or something you'd like to say to our listeners? Don't just take what I've said and just go off and do it. Please make sure that you've got permission from the organisation. If you are a senior BDM or you're a junior SDR or you're an AE, make sure that you're allowed to actually sell the way that I've actually discussed um, or even just voice that with your organisation. Like, hey, this guy's doing something different. Is it worth a look? Don't just go off and be the dark horse. But yeah, I think there's a lot that will literally go back full cycle to what we were doing before. I think with the a lot of changes in terms of what's considered spam and what's not, um, we'll have to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, people's tolerance for spam is getting less and less mm -hmm. and we're going to have to become more and more personalized. And that's why I think the methods that you're touting are just going to become extremely relevant for people who really want to succeed as either salespeople or marketers in the very near future. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for delivering so much of the <laughs> practical gold for taking us through your framework. I love the framework. I think it's fantastic. If our listeners want to get in touch with you to learn more about your framework, where can they find you? Yeah, I'm well, all of it's completely open source on LinkedIn. I'm LinkedIn native. Um, if we talked more about the marketing and distribution and social proof, I'd say I also repurpose that on other platforms because I need to check that there's message checks as you would in marketing. <laughs> LinkedIn is where I'm native. Also, maybe check out the podcast on Spotify after you've listened to this one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Adam. All right, listeners, make sure you follow Adam's journey. Reach out to him if you need a hand with something. Adam, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Lavendi. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you well george that was a great interview again and really strong things happening in the season's interviews and what a great guy uh, to have on fantastic guy to have on the show and adam particularly like when he says go backwards go forwards i think that's a great point and really talks about a lot of the things that we're talking about here on the show, on the 5Bs framework, to go back to the marketing fundamentals, the basics of talking to your customer and finding out what it is that they want. That's it. We've always said that marketing and sales need to work together. That's nothing new for, for us. But to have another fantastic salesperson like Adam come at it from that angle, and then he, you can see he's quite good at marketing himself. And I've always said, Kev, that the very best marketers, I think salespeople who have turned marketers, it's a dangerous combination because they bring that inherent ability to talk to customers and they're not afraid to pick up the phone. They're not afraid to get in front of them. And then they learn all the strategy behind marketing as well. It's a great combination. Maybe we can go through some of the key points from Adam for our listeners, Kev. The first one is closed circuit selling, which is Adam's framework. That means looking at the whole buying decision from marketing through sales and through to customer success to be on the buying decision. Yeah, such an interesting point and looking at that whole process beyond just the sales funnel, like we talk about talking to your customers, to your dream customers before that buying decision a lot on the show, but he also takes it a step further and says, talk to them after beyond that buying decision as well. Once they're past the sales team, do they actually get past legal finance, all these different kind of things that also form part of the buyer's journey of the customer's journey into your product. So very important to look at that whole buying decision. The second point that he made that we think is very good was get marketing accountable and get their leadership up as well. Let your best sales veterans do those important conversations with dream customers, with your existing customers about the whole buying process, but make sure marketing is accountable to get them aligned, to get them across the board uh, with things like, do we need more leads or do we actually need more high quality leads or do we even not need leads at all? Just have a few more conversations with our best customers to get together something to go to market with that actually reflects the needs and wants of those customers. All very familiar, something that we talk about in the first B of our 5Bs framework, be ready. Fantastic to see that that's Adam's approach too. Another thing that I really love that he said, Kev, was you got to focus on things like permission-based creative and asking for permission and having those conversations with your customers, past, present, and future. This works particularly well when you're going after those mid-market and enterprise clients where 
tailored permission-based content really helps drive that relationship forward, makes that deal move faster, gets everyone on the same page. So very, very powerful strategy there. And of course, Kev, his catchphrase, which I think is one of the best and is stuck in my head, it's go backwards to go forwards. Go back to talking to your customers and away from lead gen based tools and go forwards with your business. All right, listeners, go and find Adam Manderovich on LinkedIn and also be sure to check out his podcast as well. As always, we're absolutely stoked that more and more of you are joining us each and every Monday to listen to the podcast. If we can ask one thing, it would be to please pass on the show to someone who you think might enjoy it and get value from it or leave us a short review on whatever platform it is that you listen or check us out on it's an amazing help to us our future listeners and we really really appreciate it thank you george thank you adam thank you all our listeners take care and see you all next week thank you everybody thank you adam take care and catch you next week